Hey gang, now that one tank is emptied and the other is refilled, let's continue with part two. Are you, are you hearing a delay? Yes, a little bit. Every now and then you cut out and come back. It's not significant enough that it, inter that it interferes with my understanding what you're saying, but our connection seems to be strange. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to do, see if it's here or you're always, the video is always foggy. Really? When I see you now. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. It's always been. Um, you're kidding. But then, but then when it uploads to the internet and I download it to do the editing, you're clear as a bell. Wow. Well, and you've been fuzzy I, I, in and out today. Yeah. yeah. I knew that. Um, be, and they tell you that, that uh, the quality is better than what you're seeing. Oh, okay. Um, uh, where was I going with that? Um, but I'm wondering if there's also an issue this time with the audio as well, that, that, like that, um, that closing, you know, we kind of tripped over each other and, uh, <laughs> we do, week, that all you, the time. Do, do that <laughs> when, when we, we went into the from the first episode into the second one. Yeah. yeah you're getting uh, we never said I'm, I'm nerds. No. <laughs> Okay. What was we that? never do. We, um, yeah, it got we, we weird. Did, I, 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 you're you're well, yeah, weird now. It, it, uh, oh, the video? The video and the audio. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, I'm, okay. hearing, I'm hearing wow. myself just fine, but you're real blurry and you're kind of cutting in and out now and then. Okay. All right. So you had said we are close to our time or whatever you, you had pointed out. And I said, yeah, we're at 34 minutes. Oh, and I'm like, okay, well, here it comes. You know, I'm Jane Stahl and, and, and okay, I'll stop it <laughs> that. And, and, and that never happened. And we go right into the next topic in the next episode. I'm like, where in the hell am I going to cut this? <laughs> oh, I, I have after to, getting into it, we have listen to be better. About four times. I, I went back through and, and decided the right spot four times. Um, oh, no. But I put that same. And, in fact, I think last week I told you about it. The mm -hmm. clips that I created for, you yeah. know, I said, we've done it again. We've done and talked <laughs> the episode yet. Uh, yeah. So for when we continue to the next, like we're doing today, um, <laughs> I found a spot for that. And Good. then, of course, I just, instead of the five, four, three, two, one countdown, it goes mm -hmm. right into like there's a cup of coffee and and it's me yeah, again yeah. and I say you know uh, you know now that uh, tanks are emptied and, and or some of the time to fill it up or whatever I don't know um, here, let's continue uh, mm -hmm. yeah last whatever. week I had to put it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well what was it what, where last week I was at the studio is that right. Was that last week? Uh, no, that was Phil Rep. Okay. That was last weekend because uh, that was Phil Repco. That was um, so week much week. fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, he's a he's a bright guy. I always oh, knew yeah. that. Um, you scared me when he said when you said that uh, that that he didn't like Hillary. I'm like, oh god. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, well, if you I, I... Hillary for one reason or another, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, realize, oh, excuse me, realize the, what your options are. And I think that's something that's happening right now. And he made a great mm -hmm. point. You still see people that are on the Trump train. But we've been seeing people get off. You don't see new people getting on. People get on. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And I've been saying that. Not in those words, but I've been saying that. Right. That's true. That is true. That is true. Okay. But, uh, so happiness. So feeling good. The yeah. new mood therapy. In um, the first of maybe one... <laughs> or maybe a half a dozen episodes where we are looking at understanding happiness or understanding why we're not 
or understanding how to, you know, be more effective people in, in our lives and worlds today. And there have been a number of important, uh, there, I shouldn't say it that way. There have been a number of things I have read or a number of people with whom I've become acquainted throughout my, particularly my teaching career that have helped me understand human beings a little bit better and life a little bit better and being able and, and we're able, I think in my career sometimes um, to make life a little bit more understandable and palatable to a number of students. So, you know, I bring to our sessions some of the things that have impacted in my understanding about life and understanding how better to live it. How's that? You know. Yeah. Anyway, so decades ago, and again, in our upcoming series, however many episodes it ha tends to be, there are a number of of writers whom I will bring to uh, to our audience's attention that have influenced me to some degree. And decades ago, this book, and I just need to take a look at really briefly when it was published because it's been quite a while. The pages are yellow. So it's, you know, not a brand new book. It was published in 1980. Okay. By David Burns. And again, he's an MD and the book is feeling good. The new mood therapy. But what he does in there is remind us that feelings that our feelings aren't facts. And like I said in our previous episode, what, one of the things I tried to do with my students was to remind them that just because they get up in the morning and are feeling crappy doesn't mean that they have to feel crappy the rest of the day. What they can do, you know, and I read once where it's in the first 30 seconds of upon waking, you decide who you're going to be in any particular day. But even if you wake up and you're feeling kind of crappy, doesn't mean you have to be crappy, feeling crappy the rest of the day. If you act, do something healthful, mentally, physically, you know, diet wise, uh, you can change your feelings because feelings aren't facts. Feelings follow actions. So act in some healthful way and guarantees your feelings will change. But nonetheless, he also talks about how um, our feelings are, are so determined by how we think about things. There you go. Um, as you know, um, not to interrupt, mm -hmm. but as you know, I do, uh, I need to actually get back to this for the expression too. Um, yes. Occasionally write on inspiring and, uh, celebrities or business people or whoever um, that have influenced me by one of their quotes and a guy by the name of Damon John, who is the founder of the clothing brand called FUBU and is another wow. um, entrepreneur. And in one of the investors on the TV show, the shark tank. Love that show. Says, You're not stuck where you are unless you decide to be. Very good. And as soon as you said about, you know, waking up and, and deciding what your day is going to be like, uh, I thought, yep, I, I know the perfect quote. There you go. Anyway, David Burns talks about how we think and basically our perspective, perhaps you can phrase it that way, but how we think determines our feelings. And he calls, he, he deter, or he identifies 10 cognitive distortions that that create problems in our obviously in our thinking but also in our feeling and then how we go about making decisions for our lives and i thought it might be helpful just to go through those 10 cognitive distortions and there's a quiz at the end not that necessarily we will take it although we could as a quiz at the end say, giving not, certain not scenarios it. Pardon me? I'm going to create some show notes. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that's not what I wanted there to do. There you go. So as you're creating your show notes, the first cognitive distortion is called all or nothing thinking. You see things in black and white categories. And if your performance falls short of perfect, 
you see yourself as a total failure. And I am aware these days of certain uh, conversations in which people say, okay, now which is it? Yes or no? Demanding that it be one or the other. It can't be both or it can't be anywhere in between. And what those folks are trying to do to the people with whom they're talking is placing them in this all or nothing thinking, this cognitive distortion. So as we are able, when people come at us or when we come at ourselves and thinking, oh my God, I, I didn't do that 100% correct, we can't get into the distortion of thinking that you're a total failure. I mean, what is the quote that says um, the trying to be perfect is the destructor of joy? Being comparative thinking is the destroyer of joy. And people urge you not to let perfection get in the way of being being good. Yeah. As it sometimes does. So that's all. That's one. So um, the second one is labeled overgeneralization. You see a single negative event as a never ending pattern of defeat. So you, you don't succeed at water skiing on the first try, on the first try. And you think, well, I just, I just can't do this. This is not what I am able to do. Instead of seeing it as practice, as seeing it as, I mean, and there are all the stories of, you know, how many times did Edison try to invent the light bulb and failed? You know, and right. so many of us give up way too soon. So that's have, overgeneralization. Another, oh, you, I, I, go I, ahead. Pull it up. <laughs> I, I can give it to you. Um, Nelson Mandela. Okay. Uh, oh, so one of my heroes. Yeah. He never loses. He either wins or learns. There you go. Oh, that's beautiful. That's very similar to Edison saying it was never a failure. I just know won't work was right. with his comments with regards to the light bulb when he was looking for a filament. There you go. There you go. Number three is mental filter. You pick out a single negative detail and dwell on it exclusively so that your vision of all reality becomes darkened like the drop of ink that discolors the entire beaker of water. And isn't that so common that we allow one single event, whatever it is, in a relationship, in a job, in, in you know, a hobby even, we allow one single thing to say that's the whole of it. Number four, disqualifying the positive. You reject positive experiences by insisting they don't count for some sort of reason or another. And you hold on to this negative belief that is contradicted by your everyday experiences. Like you succeed one time and say, well, that was only one time. That doesn't mean I can do it over and over and over again. Or, I mean, so positive, so so familiar are, you know, people's um, uh, compliments. What do we hear more? The single negative thing that people will say about us. And that's a generalization, I suppose, that I have learned over the years that people can, 10 people can say, oh my God, what a great job you did. But what do you concentrate on? The single negative feedback that you get. Now, granted, that's where the learning happens, but still it influences our feelings. We are hurt by that single negative thing as opposed to paying attention to the positive, the many more positive things that are said. Right. That I find really typical. Number that's five also is sounds like the, uh, oh, I was just to say that also sounds like the negative Nancy. You know, it doesn't matter there what you happens. You know, you're you're the, the, the negative Nancy as it's called. 
um, who yeah. just has something bad to say. Or, <laughs> you know, one of my favorites is, you know, is the inability to experience joy because you know it won't last forever. Therefore, in order to protect myself from disappointment, I will expect the bad to happen. Just I can't yeah. really appreciate this. Yeah, <clears throat> you said it. <laughs> That's crazy. Number next, jumping to conclusions. You make a negative interpretation, even though there are no definite facts that convincingly support your conclusion. And jumping to conclusions has two two examples here. Number one is mind reading. You arbitrarily conclude that someone is reacting negatively to you and you don't bother to check this out. This one drives me crazy. When I recognize that someone is reading my intentions, you know, that um, I will do something or say something and another person will say, well, that's because you think this, or that's because you have this intention. That drives me nuts. That is a super trigger for me. Please don't read my intentions. Okay. Ask me why I did a certain thing or why I said a certain thing. Don't assume that, you know, I mean, there's part projection in there, you know, that uh, people assume you do a thing or think a thing or feel a thing because they do. That's how they would react. I'm not you. Ask me. Don't read my mind. Honestly, that's one of my hugest triggers that have created (laughs) arguments (laughs) among people I care about. Politics. Yeah, I was going to say politics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, Joe Biden is a libtard. Exactly. Yeah. What's and what does he, he stand must, on? Yeah, yeah. He must yeah. be. He must be behaving this way because he is this. No, please yeah. ask me. Tell, ask me to explain. Don't assume you know what I'm thinking. The second one is the fortune teller error. This comes again under jumping to conclusions. In the fortune teller era, you anticipate that things will turn out badly and you feel convinced that your prediction is an already established fact. That's jumping to conclusions. Number six is a favorite. Magnification or catastrophizing or its opposite, minimization. You exaggerate the importance of things just as your goof up or someone else's achievement or you inappropriately shrink things until they appear tiny. Again, your own desirable qualities or the other fellow's imperfections. This is also called the binocular trick. So again, we are seeing things incorrectly. Number seven, a favorite, emotional reasoning. You assume that your negative emotions necessarily reflect the way things really are. Because I feel this way, therefore, it must be true. And once again, feelings aren't facts. Number eight, a favorite of many folks, should statements. You try to motivate motivate yourself with shoulds and shouldn'ts as if you had to be whipped and punished before you could be expected to do anything. Musts and oughts are also offenders. The emotional consequence is guilt. When you direct should statements toward others, you feel anger, frustration, and resentment. Those are the shoulds. And there's some kind of a poem that says you should eliminate the shoulds and the coulds and the oughts and the musts because of the shame and guilt that they engender in oneself or in other people. So I have a problem, um, not a problem necessarily, but um, when people do things, wonderful, wonderful things, it's hard for me to say I'm so proud of you because it seems so manipulative. Who am I? What does my pride matter? And so Mm -hmm. I typically say I'm happy for you rather than I'm proud of you, because that assumes I have something to do, that you would count my opinion as something worth something, which it isn't. I'm happy for you when you do 
wonderful things. Okay. Uh, you, I don't know. I think you're discounting yourself, though. I think you're discounting yourself, though. I think that well, you're discounting yourself to a degree. One can like, say it that if, way, if, but if, I don't feel discounted, so therefore. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, okay. I, yeah. I don't feel discounted. I just don't want to. I don't want to add to anybody's, what do you say, dependence on other people's opinion. I, I don't want, I don't want people's More than social media of themselves. Yeah. I don't want people's opinions of themselves to be dependent on somebody else. They need to go inside themselves and figure out who you are rather than look at other people and say, who am I? You know, what should I be? Am I okay today? Are you, you know, are you proud of me? And does that make me an okay person? Your opinion of me? No, it needs to come from inside. So that's where all that, that's where all that static comes from in, in my world. Number nine is labeling and mislabeling. And uh, David Byrne says, this is an extreme form of over-exaggeration. Instead of describing your error, you attach a negative label to yourself. I'm a loser. When someone else's behavior rubs you the wrong way, you attach a negative label to him. He's a goddamn louse. Mislabeling involves describing an event with language that is highly colored and emotionally loaded. So, you know, with that one, um, we've been encouraged to say, no, you're not, a, you, you, have, you have lost this event, that doesn't mean you as a person are a loser. It's that you have not succeeded in this particular event or in this particular something. So we're not labeling the person, but just acknowledging the event or something or, or, or behavior, not the person. And the last one is personalization. This is a favorite. And it drives me crazy too. You see yourself as the cause of some negative external event, which in fact you were not primarily responsible for. And you apologize incessantly because something happened as if you had anything to do with it. But feeling that, feeling that one is responsible for something that happens is a real cause of, of feeling lousy. If you feel responsible for everything bad that happens to the universe or everything bad that happens to another person, over-personalization is, is the problem, is the cognitive distortion here. Okay. So those are the 10, <laughs> 10. How do you think? What do you think? Yeah. And that, that's, so what does he say, if anything, for and example, I may not be able to answer this. It's been decades since I read the book. Go ahead. <laughs> and, and that's okay. You may, but this is kind of a, the, the, I'm sure there's, we can ask a question like this for all, all 10. Um, but like with mislabeling and, and labeling and uh, you, you had said, oh, that guy's a louse or mm -hmm. he's lazy or something. What if it's really true? <laughs> what if he's he really is a bad president? then we have to examine this. I mean, what we should do is say, my conclusion is that he's a bad president because he acted this way. He said this, and those were bad things that he did and bad things that he said, which perhaps do not contribute to the well-being of the country or the well-being of a relationship or the well-being of something. Yeah. That you're suggesting we shouldn't be able to judge a thing, but I think that we need to come up with rubrics, perhaps, <laughs> that help us to define what a good president is, what a good president does, what a good president says. And I think that people need to um, establish that. For example, you know, and you had mentioned this in a previous episode, probably, that you know, there are many uh, evangelicals who count themselves as good Christians, but they've forgotten the rubric of what makes them that, do you know? 
And so to call themselves good Christians or to call themselves Christians at all when they behave in this particular way, this is not, doesn't fit, doesn't, doesn't work. You know, if you're going to label yourself as this, then this is how you have to behave. This is how you have to, you know, well, this is, these are the kinds of things you say, and these are the kinds of things you don't do. And these are the kinds of things you don't say. And when you do not match that, so there's a reason to be able to do that. And so in another episode, perhaps we will, we will give those virtues maybe that Benjamin Franklin listed in his own. Did we talk about that? No. Yes. So you, um, you uh, introduced it yeah. in the previous episode. Yes. Yeah. One of the things I want to go back and research is uh, Benjamin Franklin back in the day, not that by any means is he a saint and by any means does he admit to being a saint. He's not. But he at one time developed a list of virtues and he made himself a chart and said, okay, I'm going to behave I'm going to practice this virtue, I forget how long, maybe a day, maybe a week, I don't know, but he had a chart and he failed in his chart all the time, but he had, <clears throat> pardon me, 10 virtues. <clears throat> and maybe we will look at those as the kinds of rubrics I'm talking about that make you a good person and that that make your relationships and your behaviors better for the health of your relationships or better for the health of the country if we're talking about presidents. So they are. But okay. isn't isn't that uh, isn't that an example of both his his failure in the virtues? Isn't that you know? Shouldn't we just be looking at the fact that hey, you know what? You tried, as opposed as to the an examples to learn. Yes, yes. But but yes. as the overgeneralization, that, you know, he accomplished all these virtues, but he didn't do these two. Now he's yes. a failure. Yes, you and he didn't the do them eight. every single time. Yes, yes, yeah. he was learning. Yeah, I think Benjamin Franklin had a pretty good opinion of himself and was able to not go to catastrophizing or minimizing. It seems to me. Do you have you ever seen um, one of my favorite actors? I think we talked about him for some reason. I think because of when he was in Howard Stern's movie Private Parts. Um, one of my favorite kind of character actor, um, but definitely great at what he does, is an actor named Paul Giamatti. Okay, yes. Okay. Um, he uh, play, He was in Private Parts. He played Pig Vomit, the uh, program director at WNBC in New York. Okay. Um, he was actually, and you'd have to really see it. You wouldn't have known it unless you know who he is. He was actually one of the apes in the Mark Wahlberg Planet of the Apes revamp. Oh, my God. Um, he was also in the movie Sideways. Okay. We've seen that one. He, but when I think one of his best roles, in addition to private parts, was as John Adams in the HBO miniseries John Adams. Okay. And he was the lead in that. And that's why I wasn't going to say, well, he's not a leading act. It, well, he was, and, and he did an amazing job at it. Mm -hmm. The actor, I, I'm brain farting on his name. I know who he is. Uh, he played the mob boss in the Christian Bale Batman movies. Um, okay. He was also in... Um, uh, the little hotel or something, the little something hotel or the one with Judy Dench and, uh, um, all the older people, the one dies and, um, that, <laughs> <I'm> sorry, uh, <laughs> I don't know. He, he was hmm. one of, he was one of the, you know, love interests in that movie. Hmm. He did an excellent job at playing Benjamin Franklin. Okay. In, in the okay. in the Sam Adams series. Okay. Or I'm sorry, in the John okay. Adams series. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll have to go back and take a look at that. Anyway, I don't yeah. know where we are in terms of time, but I wondered if you wanted to... David Burns gives some hypotheticals here. And I was wondering if you wanted to see if you could identify 
since you're taking episode notes, if you can identify, if you want to try to identify the cognitive distortions in these scenarios. Want to give it a shot? Okay. Um, let me use my vertical screen. And that way I can expand my two pages here into one big document. There we go. Are you ready? Yeah, I don't know if you can see that. Um, there it is over there. There you uh, go. On my, on my portrait, my vertical monitor. Uh, <laughs> let's see what we can do here. All right, now you're going to pretend you're a housewife. And your heart sinks when your husband has just complained disgruntedly that the roast beef was overdone. The following thought crosses your mind. I'm a total failure. I can't stand it. I never do anything right. I work like a slave. And this is all the thanks I get. The jerk. Those thoughts cause you to feel sad and angry. Your distortions include one of the following, one or more of the following, all or nothing thinking, overgeneralization, magnification, labeling, or all of the above. I, I'm thinking of it. It's the one with, um, you know, there's, X number of positives like we just talked about, but it's the yes. one negative that f you focus on, uh, all or nothing thinking. And actually, David Burns suggests that all of those cognitive distortions are in that particular example. And he goes on to explain it this way. He says, now I will discuss the correct answers. Any answer you might have circled was correct. If you circled anything, you were right. And here's why. When you tell yourself, I'm a total failure, you engage in all or nothing thinking. Right. Cut it out. The meat was a little dry, but that doesn't make your entire life a total failure. When you think, I never do anything right, you are overgeneralizing. Never? Come on now. Not anything? When you tell yourself, I can't stand it, you are magnifying the pain you are feeling. You're blowing it way out of proportion because you are standing it. And if you are standing it, you can stand it. Your husband's grumbling is not exactly what you like to hear, but it's not a reflection of your worth. And finally, when you proclaim, I work like a slave, and this is all the thanks I get the jerk, you're labeling both of you. He's not a jerk. He's just being irritable and insensitive. Jerky behavior exists, but jerks do not. Similarly, it's silly to label yourself a slave. You're just letting his moodiness sour your evening. So there. Yeah. So anyway, he gives a number of, I don't know that we want to go through them, but he gives a number of scenarios and quizzes people on um, in the book and quizzes people about what cognitive distortions there are. So we might want to, you know, just start, thinking about when we're feeling crappy, we might start thinking about what cognitive distortions may be in play and it may help. It may help to eliminate their power. How's that? I'm going to see if I can limit, not limit. No, that's not what I want to say. Um, lo, uh, what is a shrink the size and maybe you know, edit out some of the examples or information. Okay. So put it all on one page. Uh huh. And make it and, the graphic. And and that yeah, and then create a graphic out of it, and like put this into my um, uh, inspirational folder where all the quotes are. There you go. And, and you know, put the ten, ten. Uh, you ought not a uh, or the, the ten you shouldn't. <laughs> Now, while you're trying to do that, um, if anyone is interested in his book, um, there are other chapters. There are practical applications. There's a practical application chapter uh, that includes start by building your self-esteem 
and how to talk back to yourself and ways of defeating guilt. Part three is labeled realistic depressions. There's, and, and the only thing that's mentioned in there is that sadness is not depression. There's a difference between the two. Is that, uh, four, is that all practical application? No, practical applications. That is part two. Start by building your self-esteem. Okay, and then what was next? Nothingism. Part three is realistic depressions. Sadness is not depression. There's a difference between being sad and being depressed. Part four is prevention and personal growth. And, you know, this one has a number of chapters. The cause of pre- the cause of it all, the cause of the problems. There's the approval addiction, the love addiction. We have to be, we have to get everybody's approval. We have to get everybody's love. Your work is not your worth. And finally, dare to be average. Ways to overcome perfectionism. That to me was an important chapter important part. And then part five is defeating hopelessness and suicide. The ultimate victory, choosing to live. Part six, coping with the stresses and strains of daily living. Um, In there, he writes about practicing what he preaches. And then part seven is really important one the chemistry of mood and it's the consumer's guide to anti-depression drug therapy. Now that section I would suggest is probably not as helpful today as it was in 1980 because there are so many, there's been so much research. There's been so much, you know, much uh, progress or maybe lack of, I don't know, in the pharmaceutical department. And maybe I can't call it progress. Maybe we should go back to, you know, uh, 1980 in the ways that we address depression. Um, because there are, you know, our, our pharmaceutical uh, environment, the pharmaceutical industry has gone crazy with all kinds of drugs that they use to virtually, in many cases, experiment on people see how this one works. If that one doesn't work, let's try something else. And it's, Hmm. it's, it's a dangerous game. Yep. So anyway, that's David Burns um, book. And perhaps there's something useful in it for our audience today. Awesome. I think I got everything. Good. Now I don't know how long we've been talking here. Plenty, but uh, plenty. Okay. (laughs) So Let's wrap up this particular episode and uh, move on to something else next week. Absolutely. Meanwhile, I'm Jane Stahl. And I'm Jurgs. And this is... Both Sides Now. All right. See you next week, everybody. (laughs) Good. Good.